Good morning. You are back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are continuing our committee discussion and consideration of Prop 2, uh, clarifying uh, the prohibition on slavery and indentured servitude in the Vermont Constitution. And um, the committee was hoping to have an additional perspective on the history of our Constitution and, um, and on what clarifying this prohibition would mean for the state of Vermont. And so, Mr. Gillies, you were requested, and I am so thrilled that you uh, had the flexibility to be able to uh, drop what you were doing on this Thursday morning and join us. So thank you so much for being here, and we would welcome you to share your perspective on the Vermont Constitution and on the proposed constitutional amendment. Well, thanks for inviting me. It, um... I'm Paul Gillis. It's pronounced uh, different than it's spelled. I spend my life correcting one way or another. <laughs> and I've uh, I've had uh, I've had some experience with the Vermont Constitution. I've written a, a book about it. Uh, it hasn't been published, but uh, and I've lectured on it. And I've uh, I think I may have taught it once or twice. So anyway, uh, what do I know about it? Well. I know that Article First was uh, uh, one of the unique sections of our Constitution, one of the few that we didn't copy from Pennsylvania, that it has uh, remained essentially unchanged with the exception of uh, the change to uh, in uh, 1924. And uh, when I, there's been a couple of years since I've looked at this question of the uh, Proposition 2, my first reaction was that it was unnecessary, that uh, although uh, I think there's a, a sensitivity here about the way things are written, it's not, uh, it's not all true. Uh, you don't, we don't uh, 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 bind somebody, for instance, send them to uh, prison for debt anymore. Um, it's not all perfect, but then the Vermont Constitution isn't perfect. There are sec many sections of the Vermont Constitution that we have never respected or we've uh, moved ourselves away from. I, I, the literature in Vermont history has recently shown that there was a lot more slavery in Vermont over the years than um, than you would believe if you'd accepted the 1777 constitution as uh, eliminating any possibility that there was slavery. Uh, the infamous case of uh, the judge of the Supreme Court, Stephen Jacob, who had a slave, had purchased a slave. I think they said recently that they had found the bill of sale for Dinah and uh, when she got older, she uh, was uh, thrown onto the uh, welfare of the town of uh, Springfield, I guess it was, or no, Windsor. And, uh, and she, the town sued Jacob to, for her support and uh, the Supreme Court, of which he was a member, although he stepped aside, said, well, no, slavery is not allowed in Vermont, so we couldn't possibly treat her as a slave. And uh, the town had to end up paying for her uh, wages. But there was there was a, a number of uh, uh, early, well, the, the census, I think, in 1791 showed that there was half a dozen slaves. And there's, there was a professor at the University of Vermont who wrote a book about it. And and yet, in all the 200 years since then, I don't I haven't heard anyone raise a possibility that slavery was authorized in Vermont because of this section. And certainly we have the, the U.S. constitutional amendments, which took care of that. So I suppose we could go through the Constitution, Vermont Constitution, line by line and strike things we don't like. But I... Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any objection to the way that uh, the Proposition 2 is written, but I, my, as I say, my first reaction was this may be a little bit more 
sensitivity to things that aren't law. And uh, there I am. <laughs> Thank you. Questions from committee members? Uh, Representative Murphy. Good morning and thanks for, for coming. I just want to make sure you can hear me. I can. Good. We're, we're getting used to some new technology here. And uh, I know I'm not familiar with it, trusted as, as well. So thanks for affirming that. Um, kind of a bigger question. Do you see the Constitution, either the state or the nation, as, as a living, breathing document that was written in paper, not in stone? I like that sound of that. Um, I, I long believe that uh, uh, we don't pay enough attention to the, uh, particularly the Vermont Constitution. And I think in history, you have periods of 10 or 20 years at a time where it never appears in in anything other than, well, in the, uh, by the decennial amendment process, but it's, uh, I, I think uh, it's obviously a fundamental document and the Supreme Court has treated it as such. Uh, there, in some seasons, it has had more sensitivity to its uniqueness as opposed to the US Constitution, particularly in the area of search and seizure. And uh, uh, I believe it is obviously a living document and it could be livelier. <laughs> Thank you. Representative LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, Paul. How are you, sir? Good. Thank you. Um, I think you started out by saying that you, you questioned whether it really needed to happen or not. Um, we had an, another, I guess you would mean, constitutional expert come in as well, um, uh, Professor Teachout. And Peter, Peter Teachout. Yes, sir. Um, he's he's admitted that he's sort of been on both sides of this discussion as far as whether he feels that it's justified in changing the language or not. Um, would you characterize your position as that you, and I recognize we're sort of just calling you last minute here, um, has your feeling about the, this change changed or not, personally? No, I guess not. I mean, I, I don't know that I've ever stated a position as to whether I would, I, I'm, I probably would vote for it. I mean, it's, it's not offensive, but it's just, uh, it's almost, uh, it's almost overkill, I think is where I'm thinking it's, it's almost too sensitive to things, but um But no, I guess I, I've been, I, my reaction is today the same as it was then. I recall reading what uh, Professor Teachout wrote about it originally, and it was pretty good in summarizing how I felt at the time. And I haven't read anything recently. Uh, good. I think, it, you know, I think constitutional amendment is an important question, and I think it needs evidentiary support for us to start meddling with the firmament here and uh and i don't know that there is any there, there is any just justification for this other than a kind of cosmetics representative anthony uh thank you madam chair and thank you very much uh Paul Gillis for coming um, on short notice. Uh, I, I um, have not vacillated uh, as has been described uh, in respect to Peter Teachout going back and forth between reverence and uh, practicality or sensitivity. Uh, I've always uh, viewed the language uh, and the act of amendment as a very serious matter. Um, but after all, it's not for wise men like yourself or myself 
for anybody, <clears throat> frankly, <clears throat> to control the process <clears throat> is, after all, a vote of the people after, uh, if you will, the iterations preceding the votes. And so it's not for me to project my reverence for history uh, onto that uh, exercise. I, I can't help, though, but say that when Peter Tichau did um, point to the uh, change in the level of sensitivity, the level of uh, scrutiny, the level of awareness of the history and legacy from the uh, 19th, 18th, and 19th century, it simply reinforced my view uh, that we have changed from even 10 years ago in respect to um, our uh, attempt to, um, uh, how shall I say, rescue some of the tragedies of the uh, 19th century and failed reconstruction and Jim Crow and various things which were horrifyingly real and embedded in law. Um, and, and unaddressed by uh, the federal constitution even after the Civil War amendments had been adopted. And so my sense is that there's a lot of unfinished business that explains why the sensitivity is what it is. Uh, so I'm leaning towards respecting that sensitivity uh, even though I, I, I count myself as a real appreciator of historical fact and historical evolution. And that's where I am. And, and I suspect that's what's changed from, as I say, even a decade ago. It's an awful lot of things that the, Const the Vermont Constitution should say that it doesn't say. Not, and I realize that's not before you now, but a few years ago when I was teaching the Vermont Constitution, I challenged the students to design an article from in the Bill of Rights that would protect the environment. And there's nothing in that constitution that says that. And then there was the Equal Rights Amendment, which failed back in the uh, 80s. Uh, and uh, I think if there was a need to correct or to underscore the principles of opposed being opposed to slavery, which I think that I think that that they say train has left the station, but that there could well be a, a more uh, articulate way of, of stating that than just taking some words out of the first article. But I, I'm, not a, I'm not a believer that because it's old, it should never be touched. I think our history of just not being able to amend it, except every 10 years before the 1974 amendments, meant that it became a very conservative document. And it was, I think there was only 29 amendments over the history of when it's been adopted. So I, I, I think it would be great to have a, a, a more uh, comprehensive uh, look at the things that we don't like in the, in the Constitution so that we can fix it up. You know, the Constitution says that you don't, that you meet once every two years. and. Uh, it, it, that was early gotten around by special sessions. Now it's the it's the recess session, um, and again it's well. That's where I am. <laughs> I'm not here to defend the uh, original uh, language. I think that the I, I think that there have been several dozen decisions that have been made over time by the Vermont Supreme Court. Uh, interpreting article first, and none of them have found it wanting in any way. I think Senator Benning was, was the one that made the most memorable attack on, on it, or, or, or tried to use it so that he could, he could uh, drive uh, his motorcycle without a helmet. <laughs> but the Supreme Court didn't uh, allow that to go through, in part because they said that the fundamental uh, uh, principles of uh, enjoying and defending life and property, acquiring, possessing, and project protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety do not go into the issue of motorcycle helmets. 
<laughs> a valid attempt, I, I can imagine that, that was entertaining. Uh, Representative Vyhovsky. Thank you. I'm struck by the here by the importance of the context of history and the fact that our laws and our constitution are and have always been written by people with power and influence. And what we heard in testimony from the people who did not have the power or the influence to be able to write the words on the page in our constitution is that this is important and that we, and I think we need to listen to the people who given the context of history had no say in what the words on the page were. I think we have to check in with our own power, our own identities and really start and ask ourselves who doesn't think this is important and why that is. I, you know, when we, we look through the context of history, those documents were written largely by landowning white men and we've made shifts and changes to our constitution to include more people in those proce processes and the structures still largely exclude many. And so I think it is really important to look at the whole picture here. And, and when we're hearing from the people who didn't get a say that this is important, I think we owe it to them to listen. Oh, sure. I think uh, it's important to remember that until 1870, that the, uh, the people didn't vote on the constitutional amendments, that it was done through the uh, uh, Council of Censors and the Constitutional Convention. So that, that um, but I, I, I don't doubt that uh, self-interest plays a role in all legislation uh, or constitutional amendments. And, uh, and I, I certainly think you, you, you have an obligation to listen to what people have to say. But in the historical context, I, I don't know that I agree that the, say, the first 100 or 150 years of Vermont history were ruled by self-interested white supremacists, because I don't think they even thought of themselves as that. I think there was, uh, I think there was, if, when I look and read about what people say when they're in uh, our legislature and, and, and as governors, I see I don't see any of that prejudice or that uh, that approach. I see, I, I've been writing for the last three years and writing a book, tracing the history of Vermont through the governor's inaugurals and the response of the legislature to the proposals that the governors make. And I can tell you, uh, although I was, uh, there were times where I felt a little jaded about the process that it's an extremely inspiring process and that the best words of the best governor's inaugurals should be enshrined on the walls of the state house. Um, and I don't see, I, I think there was uh, prejudice against women. I think there was uh, uh, that, that maybe hasn't even yet been overcome. Um, our race, racial history is complicated with, and, and it isn't as much the, uh, the black experience as the, as the other minorities that were treated poorly over time by Vermont, the French and the uh, Italians and the Irish and the Native Americans. Um, and uh, if they have positions, you should listen to them. But I, I would say overall, I don't, uh, to the extent that we take a, a lens and look at history and see it as a, as a disreputable experience, I don't, that isn't, that isn't what I, my, in my experience about my reading. Certainly wasn't the characterization that I was trying to make simply that, that there were, that the people who wrote it was a narrow perspective and we have wider perspectives now weighing in who weren't at the table then saying that this is important. I think it would be ideal if we really believed in direct democracy that we would provide a way in the constitution for the voters to propose amendments. For the same reason I believe that there ought to be uh, access to public opinion petitions for town meeting, but our law does not allow that. We, we are a representative system and, uh, and the direct voice of the people is, is rarely heard except on election day. And that's just to decide whether 
somebody gets elected or somebody doesn't, uh, except for the constitutional amendment, which is the last vestige of uh, our direct democracy, I think. I've written about the referenda in, his, in Vermont history. In some 17 times, the legislature has asked the voters, what do you think we should do? And in the majority of those cases, the voters have said to do this and the legislature's done the opposite. <laughs> or the question was asked like, when should the prohibition law, or when should the, uh, what was it the, uh, when should we build a new state office for the Supreme Court on this date or on that date? Not shall we or not. <laughs> Other questions from committee members? Well, Mr. Gillis, I really thank you again for rearranging your Thursday morning to come and spend some time with us um, and uh, and help us understand uh, your perspective on the history of our Constitution and uh, and making changes to our Constitution. Uh, we are going to be holding a public hearing tonight, um, and it is our intention to move this constitutional amendment to the floor of the House um, after some committee discussion tomorrow. And so you should see it up for floor action next week. And um, if all goes as planned on your general election ballot in November of 2022. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's interesting. All right, that is all we have on the agenda for this morning committee. Um, <laughs> You have some constituent service time um, this afternoon between lunch and four, um, and uh, floor will be at three o'clock. We may have a uh, uh, happier floor debate again. Um, I'm not sure what's on the floor. I didn't see anything. Anything on the floor today? I don't think so. No. It's just got third reading of 157 and uh, budget adjustment, but budget adjustment, and then um, a 78 introduction. Of what it's the second adjustment. reading, so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. So that'll be a, maybe a debate, but a long a couple questions around that. I just guess. guessing. Good to know. All right. Um, Thank you for getting him in. Yeah, appreciate that. That uh, was uh, Andrea. She uh, she managed to track him down while he was running errands. <laughs> Pulled him right out of the hardware store and said, "Go home to your uh, <laughs> to your computer." And I don't uh, think you were here, but he he would be um, an excellent resource for the fences around cemeteries discussion. <laughs> oh, shall we? Shall okay. <laughs> I want that. So um, clear. Andrea, would you be able to share the um? the fence, cemetery fence bill with uh, Mr. Gillis and ask him if he would be interested in testifying on the history of fencing around cemeteries sometime in the next week. Sure, I'll send him an email. Thank you. We're still on live, so just let me know when you're done. Um, committee, any other uh, committee discussion? I think what I wanted to do before we, um, before we wrapped, for the day was a little more committee discussion on the charters that we looked at yesterday. Um, it's my intention to build into our agenda next week uh, a visit with the um, chair of the Essex Select Board, the Unified Select Board, and the village trustees just to get a a sense of how their conversations are going around the separation of the two municipalities. Um, what else would you like to hear? There were a few things we needed to do in order to get Springfield in, in shape to move forward. Um, so any other questions or concerns with respect to Springfield? The, the one piece of commentary that the two representatives from Springfield that I spoke with last evening was that uh, if we were going to make a choice between 
um, truncating the language uh, to have it reflect the edits that um, Tucker had talked about. That they're they're a little worried. They have a little bit of worry and concern that maybe some other things might get lost if we do that, and that we maybe should not shorten the bill just for the sake of reducing the pages. But they asked me to share that perspective. So. Tucker was saying that the authority to change select men to select board or select person or whatever gender neutral term is one that would shorten it. Um, By three or four pages, I think. Yeah. Said. Yeah. And they were worried that if you did that, it, it just might, might be confusing to folks looking at the different iterations of the bill. So we might not have that concern, but that was their concern. And I said I would pass it along. Okay. Um, did they have any uh, requests in terms of the substance of the bill? They would, they would appreciate that we pass it as as whole as it <laughs> as it, as wholly as we can. <laughs> Do we have committee agreement that we would like to? Um, remove the unconstitutional uh we get to do anything any other community I, I did adopted in their them that, that was going to be the first thing on the chopping block and they said well yes that notwithstanding we they they understood <laughs> that that was something we would probably remove i yeah. think there was a couple other points that brought up the question of cons you know brought it like it flirted the line at like yeah but the one that's blatant i think representative Yehosi was the one that said cut it so i think it's already been Right, that was, we did that yesterday. Representative Anthony? The one that sticks in my mind uh, as most uh, unusual, I guess, is the language that prohibits revisiting uh, a further charter change. And I, I, I'd, ha I'd have to uh, go back and, and read our, or watch our YouTube to, to spot it, but I, I could sense that that was, um, uh, really trying to reach into the future, which generally I'm against in terms of uh, binding people to an act today uh, forward in time. Um, uh, and that also in the revision in the reconsideration language, um, uh, I'd have to go back and read it to see what troubled me, but it seemed to mean that one's choice uh, of, of rethinking was circumscribed in a way that I'd never seen it before in my experience in municipal charters. That gave me pause, I guess, is the way. I'm not against it. It's just very unusual and flies in the face of being able to address changing circumstances. Thank you. Yeah, I'm wondering if perhaps you could pop that into an email to, you know, pull that language out, pop it in an email to Legislative Council and um, just ask him to flag that for some committee discussion when we look at the bill next week. I would like to understand whether that is a provision that is that appears in other uh, town charters because it does uh, it does seem um, to be a little bit suspect. I would say. Thanks. I'll be happy to send it my inquiry to Tucker on both points. Thank you. I think Peter and I are talking about the same thing, but I ran into one of the, the reps this morning. We, we were discussing that, and if I if I understood him correctly, um, it's in current statute now. It's in their charter currently. Um, for some reason, I, I kind of I thought I missed that, and there was going to be new language, but apparently it, it's been there, and they felt that it's worked well so far. But okay, so um, Representative Anthony, did you hear that context? Yes, I did. I still will ask Tucker whether or not uh, it uh, appears in, in uh, other charters that we're unaware of. So my sense of unusualness is, is misplaced, perhaps. Super. Brett Pickley? Did I hear uh, Tucker say that uh, they had gone through a long process of going through all statutes and changing, you know, selectmen to select boards and that sort of stuff? So was my understanding that it may not even be necessary for them to include that in a charter change? Yes, that's, I believe, what I heard him say. Yes. Yeah, that, so, that, you know, the, the number of pages where the only 
change that appears is that, you know, is changing select men to select board is unnecessary in this bill. All right. Okay. Great. Other committee discussion about Springfield. All right, now we come to the part of the show where I ask for a volunteer to be the captain of this project as it moves forward and uh, reminding folks that I want everyone to have a first turn before, before we de default to people who've already had uh, a bill. So who wants, to, who wants to be the captain of Springfield? Representative Merwicki, how do you feel about being the captain of Springfield? Well, I, I'm glad to do that. I have reported a bill already, but I'll, I'll take this. You'll note. take round two. Uh, I think Representative Hooper is going to end up reporting uh, Burlington Charter, which will keep him on his toes for the next several weeks, I would imagine. <laughs> um, I think Representative Lefebvre has one in the hopper. Should we decide to move the cemetery bill? Um, Representative Colston has PR2. Representative Gannon, I'm holding in the wings because he's got lots of things that I want him to do. Um, Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I have tag teamed before with Rep Colson. I'm happy to tag team with uh, Representative Mariki if you want to partition it in some uh, digestible way, because it is a long, uh, a long presentation for sure. Yes, not the way yes. Right. Representative well, LeClaire. A moment here. I mean, the Representative Mary C had a lot of questions about the Essex Charter change and seems to be the content expert in that now. I mean, that's coming. Yeah. Well, I was just going to get to that because <laughs> <laughs> that is also on our list of bills to, uh, to assign. And um, the, uh, the default is often to give the community um, representatives sitting around our table the first crack at um, at presenting a charter change, but given that Representative Vihovsky lives in the town and not in the village of Essex, I wondered if you would prefer to take a pass on reporting Essex charter change? I would prefer to take a pass, and I'm happy to um, take Springfield as the one person who hasn't reported a bill or doesn't have a bill in the hopper, if that makes more sense. Oh, here we go. Merwicki, wow. you, you might get off the hook after all. <laughs> I, uh, Representative I'd also be happy to tag team with Representative Merwicki if, if that makes more sense. But I do, I do think it makes the most sense for me not to be the presenter of the Essex, the city of Essex charter. Thank you. Representative LeClaire. I, I recognize I had an enormous lift with 223. <laughs> 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 so trying to recover from it. But um, in, the, in the fairness um, towards committee here, I'd be happy to participate in the Essex Charter presentation. Um, one, because having been on a select board, there, there is a little experience I can draw from to hopefully make answer some potential questions. But I'll just throw that out. But I, I do think it's large enough that it would require. So you, you're you suggesting that maybe a little Berry City, Berry Town <laughs> Ooh. work on Essex might. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I think that's wonderful as a, as a city and town who are not currently clamoring for attention of house government employees <laughs> uh, related to divorce or marriage or what are you doing? Living together or whatever. Um, I guess. Yeah, there you go. Hey, we used to we used to share a sewer truck of actor. <laughs> <laughs> of course, this, the sharing of the vector fell apart, but anyway. Well, we do share our sewage. <laughs> So, Representatives LeClaire and Anthony, <laughs> thank you for volunteering to team up on Essex, and we will have a little more um, testimony from Essex next week. And um, Representative Vihovsky and Merwicki, you, you two can uh, work together on, um, on Springfield, and I will allow you to flip a coin or say not it or whatever in terms of who presents on the floor, but what I would like to do is, is ask you to 
spend some time um, figuring out which parts of the charter you think the committee ought to consider leaving out or um, or in some other way, just flagging for me for scheduling purposes where you think we need to hear more testimony and or do more work on the bill. Um, I, you know, now that we are back in this um, meeting environment where we are hybrid and I, you know, and, and people are able to be in the building, I would love to share some of the work of um, figuring out who else needs to come and testify so that it's not me and, and Representative Gannon um, trying to, to figure out all of the witness list for the coming week. I, I do appreciate that. And I think uh, I am also cognizant of the feedback from Rep McCarthy that I think what you were saying is that Springfield would like Charter change to remain intact for the most part. as much as as much as possible. They, I think they recognize there are some things. So that I, I would then <laughs> we have look to the sense of the committee as to uh, what people think should be chopped if any. So, and I, I look forward to working with Representative Bahowski on this, and uh, we'll we can email try and figure out. The next step, does that work? Thank you. Excellent. Um, so what else do we have on our list? Madam Chair, when might we uh, be taking Burlington up again? Um, I would like us to spend a little more time hearing from uh, Burlington folks during the week next week. Um, and we'll also hear from the village trustees and select board from Essex uh, next week. Uh, Rep. Behelsky. Well, Representative Hooper asked the first half of my question, if we have witnesses we'd like to hear from on the Burlington Charter, is the best thing to do to just email you what we're thinking, Chair, Madam Chair? Uh, yes, please. Okay. That would be yep. super helpful. All right. Um, anything else on any of the charters that we were looking at? I think we have those assigned and under control. The only other bill that we took a look at this week that we haven't currently made a decision on or assigned to anyone is the one, um, the cemetery bill relating to um, investment of the perpetual care funds by cemetery associations. And I don't mind doing that as long as John helps me with that. Well, we need to take a look at what we did for municipal cemeteries. Mm -hmm. yes. Cause I think we should follow. But I don't mind right. walking that through yeah. and looking at what we did for the other one and helping it. Do you, I think what would be really helpful just in terms of, all, of get, getting up to speed on what was done before for public cemeteries is if you tried to um, make an appointment to meet with Tucker, if he's meeting virtually, you can pop yeah. off into a corner with, uh, you know, and do a Zoom with him. Uh, or if he's in the building, maybe you can sit down with him. But if you could ask him those questions and um, pick his brain as much as possible to understand, I think it would be great if we sort of batched those two and aimed to vote them both out on the same day. I know that it makes for a bit more work for you to do it simultaneously, yeah, but, um, but I think it might make for a smoother sail through the floor if we- What was the other thing we did that, I'm looking right now, but what was the other, so we had like two different things. What was the other thing? We did cemeteries and something else. Well, there were two cemetery bills. Yeah, yeah. cemetery fence oh, museums. It was per diem pay, your guys' yep. work commissions and that. So yep. we've got a subgroup working on uh, boards and commissions. Yeah, um, and then that per diem bill will be based off of what we decided for boards and commission. Yeah, I, I batched that together because the board yes. commission's bill had a proposal on per diems and I wanted us to put all of those ideas um, in front of the committee and, uh, and make a decision on how to move forward. All right, am I forgetting anything? No, I think we covered all the bills we worked on. This I feel like I'm juggling. That was every time <laughs> it's feeling like I'm juggling, you know, swords. Or... You didn't start your statement to him with Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> Alexa, what have 
I forgot. Him. <laughs> yes. All right, uh, Representative Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Uh, despite all the humor, am I am I correct that I've been invited to partner with my uh, good friend from the town on the reportage of the city of Essex Junction? Um, yes, I think that would be a, a very delicious um, uh, <laughs> team. <laughs> you know, you guys got the one-two going on there. So we have been yeah, jet yeah. and to work together. Definitely got a sense of humor. <laughs> All right. Any other questions about work that we've done this week that you think is out outstanding or lingering? Yes. This Rebecca. isn't a question about that, but uh, I ran into Nick Atherton in the uh, cafeteria yesterday, and he had said that he has set up a um, schedule for if folks wanted to come in and yep. look at certain maps or whatever. So I just thought I'd, if people don't know about that, there is a, uh, a schedule that you can sign up at certain times, I guess, to look at maps with them. So yes, yes, that is um, a, that's a really good point. So members of legislature can go on his, uh, his scheduling um, app and see when he has open office hours times. And so he's gonna leave open, um, you know, basically any time that he's not in here in committee with us or in Senate go, well, no, it's not GovOps, the Senate Re Reapportionment Committee. Um, so yeah, he will uh, make himself available and, um, and folks can meet with him. All right, Representative Anthony. Is, is that, Madam Chair, an appropriate announcement to our colleagues? Because I'm sure there are some areas in the state and those representatives know full well that the current lines cannot survive. And it might be worth our while to have them uh, directly connect with uh, and get an appointment. But I'm not sure they would automatically know that unless you announced it on the floor. So I'm trying to be respectful of the fact that Nick is brand new to this process. And I maybe, I mean, yes, ultimately we want to make sure that people know that, um, that they have access to that resource. Um, but I don't really want to open the floodgates for him uh, today or tomorrow because he is scrambling to work with legislative IT to get our redistricting website up and running and test all of the links for the various districts so that when we send the letter out, um, communities will be able to look at their own redistricting. And so I, I want him to be able to focus on that because that is the most critical step in the process that we need in order to be able to give the communities the information so they can come back and tell us um, what they think of the proposal. So um, I would uh, not want to inundate him with individual appointments just yet. And Peter, there already exists our current house districts with the 2020 census data, which shows deviations for each of those districts. And that would indicate to members whether or not it's likely that their districts would have to be redistricted. I mean, if you just look at, we have deviations that go over 20%. So I, I think as, as any member here can explain that, I think to another member, that, hey, look, there, there's, you know, a problem. You know, if they, if they say, you think I'll be redistricted, say, well, your deviation is over 20%. So, yep. Yep. <laughs> it's, yep. It's there's going to need to be some changes. <laughs> if I can, too, the other thing that needs to be explained to folks, too, is you may have worked out your district to a proper deviation, but how did you do it? I mean, did you, did you have to... You know, intrude on another district and maybe put them under or over. So there's a lot more to it than just correcting your district. And it, it, it's not all that helpful if 150 House members come in and say, "Here, this is the solution," right. because my solution mm -hmm. might throw his district out of deviation or vice yeah. versa. And um, and so, yeah, I mean, too many cooks in the kitchen. Like we we have as people around this table, we have to figure out how it all fits together. Right. I totally, totally understand and agree. First things first, sure. 
Plus, we don't care about him. He's going to be in Aruba, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We want to go. To Aruba's a little out of the district. <laughs> 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 All right. Other any other questions about uh, about the work that we've done so far this week? All right. Excellent. Um, be productive this afternoon, and I'll see you all on the house floor at three, and then again in our public hearing at five forty-five, so that we can be ready to go at six.